Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining part two of our webinar, SD-WAN and MPLS. It's a marriage, not a divorce. If you didn't have the chance to join part one of this webinar, I highly recommend that you go to the agent portal and watch that session as well. Uh, it was very informative. And the speaker today, Mike Chase, is our Senior Vice President of Solutions Engineering. Mike is a telecom veteran with deep expertise in SD-WAN and related technologies. He's previously co-founded uh, several cloud ventures and was the CTO. Mike has experience across a vast portfolio of other telecom, voice over IP, data networking, data center, and cloud service enterprises. He's a published author of many online magazine articles, columns, and blogs. In addition, Mike has over 25 years of experience designing complex data centers worldwide. During his work with such firms as Wells Fargo Bank, IBM, Mobile Oil Corporation, Union Oil, LA Cellular, Capital Records, Equant, AT&T, Broadcom, Experian, TamCloud, DinCloud, and others. Mike holds over 20 industry cert certifications such as a prestigious CCIE, the Cisco Certified Internet Work Expert, and other high-level technical certifications from Cisco, Linux, VMware, and others along with a Juris Doctorate degree in law from California Southern University. And with that said, I'd like to introduce Mike Chase. Thank you, John. appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining today for part two as we uh, dive in. My contact information is on this slide. There's a QR code under my picture there. If you uh, scan that, it'll take you directly to my LinkedIn profile. Would love to link up with you there. Going back a slide, the agenda for today, this is an extension of the uh, last webinar that we did, so we will talk a little bit about MPLS, but there's a lot of new content in here today as we're going to look at the vendor la uh, landscape, kind of do some stack ranking, uh, what our multi-vendor strategy is and how that helps you and your customers, um, some of the pricing, sizing, CPE, get into the architecture, a lot of differentiators. Talk about AirSpring's unified connectivity and how we're basically the glue, which really gives you the freedom and makes us the best choice to help you uh, build an SD-WAN solution because you get all the choices and really none of the penalties. You get to use any carrier, any circuit, and any technology, including multiple SD-WAN vendors, to achieve the purpose and not get tied into one particular uh, carrier or you know circuit topology, et cetera. And then we'll talk about what drives the revenue. What are some of the popular use cases that we're seeing in SD-WAN, which is exploding um, we're doing really, really large deals. I mean, some of the biggest deals I've seen all year are coming in this last quarter uh, with our new SD-WAN strategy. And then, of course, once you've kind of understood and bought into what's available to you on the uh, very wide menu of SD-WAN options, why use AirSpring uh, versus going with any of the other carriers or do-it-yourself and so forth. And then at the end, we'll take some questions. We've got some announcements where you can actually meet myself and some of the team at some upcoming events. In fact, I'm uh, flying out to one in Pittsburgh tomorrow. So looking forward to seeing you guys. So as we, as this year we kind of looked through the rather large digital landscape of SD-WAN providers out there, it's, you know, it's very confusing. There's a lot of them out there. Um, they do different things. Even when they call a feature the same thing, they implement it differently and, and it really is, is hard. And so we went through, did the live trials, did the technical evaluation, and really boiled it down to, um, you know, who are the top providers and who aren't. And what it really comes down to is, you know, the reality versus the hype. Uh, there's the vendors that you see at the top uh, are really the ones that are the top players. A lot of them have already, you know, gone through acquisitions like Viptela, uh, got acquired by Cisco, Velocloud is being acquired by VMware. Um, I think. Silverbeak and Citrix are, are too large to be acquired at this point, um, but you'll probably see Versa Networks get acquired, I think, as well. They're one of the last free standing top players in there. Then you've got the relevant players. They're the ones who do some very interesting things. Um, we, of course, use Mushroom Networks to do things like Bond LT and other things. We'll go through some of those differentiators when we use VeloCloud, when we use Mushroom. Nuage Networks did a lot with virtual networking. Of course, they're owned by Nokia. Uh, who's doing a lot of, uh, they took the Alcatel-Lucent IP core and virtualized it. So I think long term you'll see some promising things come from them. So they're in the relevant category. Uh, Talari Networks has a lot of interesting algorithms that they've developed, a lot of patents. Uh, Riverbed, of course, has been in the market for a long time. So shifting toward SD-WAN has not been, I, I think, too much of a, a shift for them. Similar to Silverpeak, they both came out of the WAN optimization 
field, and although they're a little bit behind right now, they're still quite relevant, and I think you'll see them probably move up a category in the future. Um, Fat Pipe, of course, has done a good job. Um, you know, recently sent out a lot of press releases about, you know, they're suing this guy and that guy with patent stuff. A lot of those patent claims were ultimately, I think, 35 out of 36 recently. The patent office said, no, it's really unpatentable or so forth. But they do have some good technology. Uh, they're based out of Utah. Um, Ariaka is a long-distance player, so when you're looking at um, international backhaul, they uh, do a decent job at it. And then, uh, you know, they're doing optimization of protocols and those sort of things, and you'll see us do quite a bit. I think on the uh, international side as well. Continuing to this slide, you know, a lot of the hype is in the bottom. Now, I'm I'm not here to pick on particular providers. I know a lot of people out there talking about, you know, some of the slides that are some of the vendors that are down here on the bottom of the slide, whether it's Big Leaf or Cloudgenix and so forth. Here's the thing. We'll kind of get into this as we as we dive deep. When you look at the features on the right, and this is what we did, and there's a there's a list of actually about a hundred more of these, literally, uh, that we went through with each vendor, and then having to um, dive into how do they actually implement the feature, even if they claim they have it. Um, uh, you know, basically, did it actually work in live trials when we put it in our labs? I mean, there's just a very exhaustive array of things that we did. But when you, the more questions you ask, the more you'll find out that a lot of SD-WAN solutions, particularly in the bottom, don't actually correct any negative network conditions, meaning they don't deal with packet loss. They don't deal with, you know, high jitter. They don't deal with out-of-sequence packets. And frankly, these are the things that make voice and video and virtual desktops and a lot of things that are being used by your customers um, unusable. Uh, and so you want a solution that does that. Because otherwise, really what the vast majority of the SD-WAN market is is problem avoidance. It means that these solutions like, you know, the Big Leafs, Cloud Genix, and others essentially have two or more circuits minimum and when they see that there's an issue on one circuit, they avoid it. They just go to the second circuit. Now, the issue with that is, of course, if you've only got one circuit in the middle of nowhere, or for cost reasons you can only get one circuit, you need to improve it. Um, there's quite a few carriers, and I, I won't name them, but we kind of laughed because we said SD-WAN makes them viable. I mean, some of the broadband carriers that were out there were so bad that they just didn't have a voice offering, or if they did, it was, it was horrible. And so once you overlay... Uh, some of these underlay circuits, and we'll get into the underlay overlay concepts a little bit later, it really makes them viable. And so that's why we're, we're really stuck on using the relevant and the top tier players, not really dealing with the bottom. Um, the other issue, too, is when you're trying to glue together different topologies and different types of underlay circuits, like point-to-point -point or Internet MPLS, and throw these all into a mix, it becomes very difficult when you're using these enterprise or lower level solutions. So in our offering, we have a terrific offering with VeloCloud. I realize there's about 40 or 50 telcos, I think it's close to 50, that claim to sell VeloCloud. Um, a lot of them, including some of the largest ones, uh, have not even integrated it with their MPLS networks at the service provider gateways. Um, others have stripped down the features or stripped down what they're willing to support because, you know, they're still getting used to the solution. What you really find with... Uh, our offering here at Airspring is that we've just peeled back the orange, we've unleashed the features, we've dramatically cut the price, and what we're willing to do is quite simply, I can say this with supreme confidence, no one is selling VeloCloud like Airspring is selling VeloCloud today. A lot of our competitors will only do two WAN uplinks, we'll do four on VeloCloud, we can do up to eight on Mushroom Networks. Um, we're providing trouble ticket management of customer provided internet links uh, with an LOA so that the customer doesn't, you know, if they bring some circuits to the mix and still want to do SD-WAN with us, and we do have some customers who, who frankly bring all the circuits and only get the SD-WAN service, the boxes and so forth, and the support from us, um, that's fine. We'll, we'll help manage those. Um, we're also looking at international deployments. You'll see more of that coming in 2018, but there's some efforts and testing going around that. Today, if you have an international deployment that you're interested in, you've got, as part of your topology, some sites that are overseas in different countries. That's not a problem. Today we'll just send that to special pricing and include that as part of the deal. So it's definitely something we can address today, although I think in the future you'll see a more robust uh, offering that will just be part of the normal product set from us. And then when it comes to portal access and MPLS integration, uh, again, these are things that we're doing no one else is doing. Not only do we give automatic access to the portal and automatic integration with the MPLS side of the network, which, by the way, all carrier cores, whether it's AT&T or it's us or you know, Windstream and other carriers, 
it's all MPLS at the core. So being able to um, not only integrate MPLS as part of a, a very high quality underlay circuit in your SD-WAN, but being able to tie uh, parts of your network that are on MPLS that may not deploy SD-WAN, uh, tie all that together is absolutely key without having to pay more. So you get access to the portal, you get uh, access and integration to the MPLS side of, of the network, um, and you don't pay any more for that. Now, for customers that, you know, typically when you look at a managed solution from a carrier, some of the customers who are very technical, and I've been on both sides of the fence, are saying, well, you know, maybe I want to do it myself, or DI, DIY, basically. You don't have to do that because we're the only carrier who's going to give you read-write access to the portal, meaning that um, this comes really handy in a couple of situations. Number one, you're an MSP or you're a very savvy agent who likes to kind of, your value add is you're going to do some management and overlay for your customer services. We can give you rewrite access. You can go set up their environment or set up, you know, we'll do the initial setup and kind of co-manage it with you, and then you can add different policies or what you want to do. It gives you tremendous control. Um, or if the customer is super technical, of course, they'll want that read-write access. And they do have to sign a waiver because, you know, in a managed service environment, if you want to take on those responsibilities, and of course you screw it up, you know, it's on you. But this is a great sales tool because it takes away, um, and it really opens, you know, it takes away all the excuses, and it really opens up the market for those people that are kind of on the fence who are technical and are saying, hey, look, I don't want the watered-down, um, you know, carrier kind of solution that I usually get. I mean, when I go buy a solution, I get access to everything. That's how I like it. Essentially, they can do that. And so that is a very, very powerful feature. And you're getting full access to the portal. So there's no, you know, um, a lot of the competitors, I think, that have opened up the portal, they've really kind of dumbed it down uh, with the granular access that you don't see all the charts and graphs. You don't see all the different bells and whistles and, and controls that you can get. So we do have that uh, read-only by default, full portal in read-only mode, and then full portal in read-write access. <clears throat> Last but not least, cloud connectivity. You get migration expertise. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm a CCIE, so when it comes to route switching, we've got a lot of um, you know, deep bench around here on both the voice and the data side. And that's really important because a lot of carriers kind of have that stop at the DMARC mentality. And when you start talking about SD-WAN, you really are integrating with their, their local area network and you know, their cloud resources, and it gets very complex quickly. These are things that we do very, very easily. That's where the unified team, unified network, unified support, unified billing, <coughs> and a unified solution in 10 really is a powerful play. Where do we use VeloCloud? Where do we use Mushroom? Um, VeloCloud, of course, is our premium offering. We've unlocked all the features. We've done it at a super low price point, including flexible licensing, which we'll cover here in a minute. Um, but it's the solution where, let's say you can only get one circuit and you want to overcome packet loss and jitter and out-of-order packets and so forth. It can do that. What it does is packet duplication and striping. So any traffic that you mark as high priority, which is typically your voice or video or it could be anything, but it's typically voice and video, um, it will start duplicating those packets so that when it sees packet loss, and we've seen it as high as 20%, you know, and for voice, you've got to get it under 1%. Uh, packet loss, where packets are making it to the other side, because you can't resend them with voice. You know, the point in time has passed. The word has been spoken. The video frame has already passed. Uh, you know, you can't go back like you can in a web session where it's like, let me just reload the page. It doesn't work. So it's measuring packets in both directions. We call this unidirectional measurement. And when it sees the packets are being lost, it will start duplicating those packets. And if it has more than one circuit, it's highly effective on one circuit, by the way, but if it has more than one circuit, it will do what's called striping, which is packet duplication, but then I'm sending them you know, upstream and downstream using different paths to increase the statistical odds that these packets will get through. So absolutely does that, just terrific, and uh, particularly on single circuits, and, and once you have multiple circuits, it gets even crazier. It just really increases the quality but it's one of the few solutions that can do that. The vast majority of SD-WAN solutions out there don't do this. They simply avoid trouble. Uh, they don't correct trouble, so VeloCloud does. And then it's very easy to create a topology that's full mesh. Now keep in mind with IP phones, you might be thinking, ah, full mesh, you know, most of my stuff in my customer's network today goes back to the cloud or goes back to their data center or maybe, you know, a little bit of both. <clears throat> well, here's the reality. When you've got an IP uh, phone, it's doing the signaling up to wherever the class 5 you know, IP base switch is, up in the cloud or up in the data center or wherever. After the phone call kicks off, it, all the traffic is phone to phone. So when you're looking at topologies, dynamic full mesh uh, is very, very important. 
um, as is hub spoke, as is hybrid, meaning sometimes it's very beneficial to mix the two of these together. Like when you've got traffic in a particular foreign country, um, you kind of want it full mesh between the sites, but then you want a hub spoke where the countries are coming back to the United States or so forth. So the ability to create these complex uh, scenarios and do it very, very easily as far as how things are going to get routed and how the traffic actually flows uh, is very, very important because I see a lot of hub spoke networks um, because they think, well, the IPPBX is back at the data center, it's in the cloud. But the reality is that the branch to branch traffic for the phone calls, um, you know, once the phone call actually kicks off, it's really branch to branch. It's not hub spoke anymore, and your topology really needs to accommodate. Um, mushroom networks, we use this where, you know, there are times where it's a, let's say, a military or government network, or for some reason it's a totally closed network, there's no internet. They still want to optimize traffic between sites. They still want to, you know, bond multiple underlay circuits together. They have different needs that SD-WAN meets. They want to, you know, AES-128 uh, up to 256-bit military-grade encryption. It will do a great job. Uh, it doesn't need a cloud orchestrator. Now, you get a lot with a cloud orchestrator, but there's times where you just, quite simply, it's not going to happen. So we use these. Also, for 10-gig interfaces, it does a great job. And then it has, uh, you know, on the Velo, we're doing up to four WAN uplinks. These will do eight WAN uplinks. And that's been particularly good uh, in the field where we're bonding LTE connections together. And since it has eight Ethernet ports on this, uh, if you take a cradle point, which we'll show you later in these slides, where you can put two SIMs into each one, that means eight of these times two. You got 16 connections. When you're doing SD-WAN, it will, because it creates a tunnel, and the load balancing mechanism in the cradle point will kind of choose between the SIMs for that outbound connection, it'll end up using about half of those, but the other half can still be used for internet traffic, and we'll talk about that with the flexible uh, licensing that we've got. So you can end up creating a really, really big pipe, um, you know, somewhere between, uh, you know, at a minimum 80 megabits per second to a total of, you know, almost 640 megabits per second uh, with LTE when you put SD-WAN on top of it and still run voice and everything else. We've done quite a few uh, interim connect connections with that. And then later in 2018, we still got our eyes, uh, particularly fourth quarter, on a couple of vendors who do WAN acceleration. They uh, do some true forward error correction, uh, where it's more of an algorithm to, than just raw packet duplication, those sort of things, and they handle some advanced and complex routing scenarios uh, that the current vendors don't. Uh, but we'll, we're still keeping our eye on those. We'll announce probably some more stuff next year. So let's talk about basically the VeloCloud architecture. The more, what I have found, uh, you know, people ask me all the time when I'm on panels, um, what do the most successful agents do uh, that sell AirSpring? And they attend our trainings. Um, some of them watch them, of course, on the web. They don't necessarily attend live, but they all learn because the smarter you get and the smarter your customers get, the more everyone uh, sells, the more they buy. And so to understand that architecture, they have the VeloCloud edges starting with the 510, 520, 540, and then the large units, which are the 840s and the 2000s. And so understanding how these work now in our tool and with our solutions engineering team, it makes it very easy to price these out. So as you select the circuits and different things, these will be chosen for you automatically. The key point to remember is that when you're um, doing kind of a hub spoke topology or different things, you'll probably wind up with the hub being one of the larger units, the Edge 840s or the Edge 2000s, just to provide the maximum number of tunnels that you need. Um, it's very similar to how the gateways run, where we've got, of course, thousands of customers coming back to our gateways, and we have to size those accordingly. Same thing happens within, let's say you've got um, uh, a little bit of, of a topology where there's a data center for the customer. That's probably going to be a hub site. So you've got to put a pretty beefy unit in there because all the different edges are going to connect back to that data center. They're also going to connect up to our gateways. They may connect up to some cloud and SaaS providers as well. All of that, of course, uh, provides encryption. And keep in mind that, that these are, uh, you know, we're providing physical boxes, but these can be virtual as well. And you see that, we'll show that in some slides later, where how do you deploy to Amazon, how do you deploy to Azure. Those are actually virtual appliances that are available in their marketplace, and so you'll spin them up there and then uh, hand control over to us. We'll license it, put it in your portal, and off you go. Uh, the gateways are always run as virtual appliances, and we're running that on our end. So as these little edge boxes get deployed out to the customer sites, what they do is create a tunnel um, to each, uh, minimum we, we peer them to two gateways for failover. And so every circuit that they have, uh, let's say you had two internet circuits, over each circuit it'll create two tunnels 
uh, one to each gateway. So if you had two circuits, you actually have four tunnels. And that's how it does the sub-second failover, because it's, it's active active across all the circuits that you have and to both gateways simultaneously, so that you don't, you know, there's really no hit if a circuit goes down or if there's some kind of upstream congestion issue, et cetera. Again, sub-second failover. The gateways pretty much um, are brainless. There's not a lot of configuration there. Um, configuration is, is stored on the edge, but it's actually provided from the orchestrator. The gateways are pretty generic, so we can literally provision those in different parts of the world in about three minutes. Um, they don't take a lot of time to put up. Uh, one of the functions they do provide is uh, connectivity to both cloud providers. Um, another way to do that, you can either do it from the gateway, you can also just, like I said earlier, spin up a virtual appliance directly in your cloud environment as a customer at AWS or Azure. Or we can do a uh, connection from the gateway over to the provider. And we've got some slides to kind of illustrate it. <coughs> but it makes it very easy. And then these can also terminate IPsec connections on the internet. And then last but not least is the Velo Cloud Orchestrator. This is what you and your customers will see most of the time. It's just a web-based portal. You'll log in. We've got some screenshots of that too. But that's really where the magic happens. Essentially all the configuration, all the real-time statistics, everything's being reported back to there, and you can see it. And then, of course, we get asked all, all the time by you know banks and financial institutions and others, um, what does the security side of things uh, look like? Essentially, all the traffic is encrypted with a PKI certificate. It's AES-128 by default, can be configurable to 256 encryption. Um, and so that's military-grade encryption, and no one can see that traffic. And that encryption key actually changes every eight hours. So highly, highly secure. In fact, um, I've got several customers who were running a pure MPLS network and actually overlaid SD-WAN just to add encryption. So here's more of a breakdown on the edges, and uh, when you see the data sheet, I decided to do this slide just to, to make it very clear what their capabilities are. So when you look at max throughput, that is, you know, essentially, um, what what's the maximum amount of traffic that you can put through this box? Because there's really th three things that you're going to look at, or actually two. I mean, there's maximum VQM, but we'll explain that. It's not really relevant. <clears throat> it's really the first two, maximum throughput. And then essentially, what's the maximum tunnel scale? So when you're looking at like a 200 meg circuit, obviously, you're not going to be using the you know, Edge 510 or 520. You'd be using an Edge 540. And of course, when you're in quote spring, it'll help you with that or just contact us in the solutions engineering team. But here's essentially how the terms break out and, uh, and the ports as well. Now, maximum tunnel scale is important, particularly when in that scenario I was telling you earlier where you've got a data center. Um, you know, most of the edges are going to have a minimum connection. They're going to have one to each gateway, so that's two connections right there out of the, you know, you look at the low end here of 25 tunnels. But when you have a hub site, and let's say you've got 100 sites deployed with SD-WAN, at the data center, let's say there's an app there they're all going to connect to, then that's going to be at least 100 tunnels, so that's why I'm saying you typically wind up with an Edge 840 or an Edge 2000, um, or in situations where, you know, you've got dynamic full mesh, any-to-any, um, if you had enough phones at each site where they were calling all the other sites, you know, that brings up a tunnel. But the tunnels are measured in active tunnels, how many are up at any given moment. It's pretty easy to figure out for us. You know, if we know you're running phones, if we know that certain apps are going back to the cloud or certain apps are going back to the data center, we'll scale it appropriately. But I just wanted you to understand what those terms meant in the data sheet. And then the last part, which is VQM. VQM stands for Voice Quality Management. Not really something you have to worry about, but if a customer for some reason wanted to run an RFC 6035 compliant collector, think of it as NetFlow. A lot of you who have been doing um, data for a long time understand NetFlow, and that is, you know, it's kind of like a packet collector, and it tells you who the source and destination, what the protocol and the application was. and gives you a deep look into the traffic versus just a bandwidth graph, right? VQM does the same thing for voice. And so uh, if they were to do that, that's the capacity is how much voice traffic <clears throat> it could actually handle with v VQM because it adds a tremendous uh, amount of overhead to it. It's not the maximum amount of voice traffic it can handle. It can handle, you know, close to its throughput and prioritize that traffic and protect it and, and turn on the, uh, you know, uh, port error correction with the packet duplication and so forth. So important to understand that one. And then here's what the uh, mushrooms look like. Again, <clears throat> this is a box that actually has four LAN ports. The LAN ports are, are really in the same VLAN. They're kind of a hub port or, or whatnot. Um, and then you've got the four uplinks. You can get the box with eight uplinks, and you can also get the box that has uh, 10 gig interfaces on it as well. 
And again, you know, we use these in closed networks where you just can't, you know, you don't have the luxury of a cloud orchestrator. It's going to be a totally closed, secure network. Um, we use it when 10 gig is needed. We use it uh, a lot to bond LTE and other circuits together. And it's a, it's a great, very straightforward box, very easy to set up and roll with. And of course, these are what we're plugging in. Um, the cradle points, we have cradle points and BECs. We'll show you the BEC in a second. But the cradle point, you can put two SIMs into it. Um, you know, when you're doing this with SD-WAN, what's kind of nice is that uh, essentially one of those SIMs will get used for the SD-WAN. The other one can be used to exit uh, internet traffic. So you can really get, you know, the best of both in there um, out of both SIMs in each unit. Um, they've got big ears, but we connect these via Ethernet, not um, USB dongle, because with Ethernet you can get a 320-foot 328-foot range, so you can place this to where you can get the best signal, which is really important. And we do have a lot of tools, um, you know, with AT&T where we can kind of tell you is 4G available in that area, you know, roughly what the latency uh, would be if you were to ping uh, from that connection, and then uh, usually some speed statistics provided by kind of a, uh, a crowd-driven network called Open Signal. So reach out to us if you're curious about LTE as either failover or tertiary for that so when you look at the live trial, I mean, there's a lot of talk about SD-WAN, but I want to get specifically into what does it really do, you know, with me, without me? What does it look like uh, with the SD-WAN picture? And as you see here, the MOS score is dramatically different. Um, what we've seen with SD-WAN is that you can do things you can never do. That horrible broadband connection in the middle of the cornfield out in Iowa, it works. Um, you can finally do voice if you put SD-WAN on it. Um, you know, basically, if you had LTE and you wanted to run 25 or 30 phones at a site, you can do it. Um, satellite connections, you can do it. I mean, it, it just corrects a wide range of issues. And we're actually going to show you, there's about four or five slides here, what it really does in the real world. So here you see that the MOS score, uh, the mean opinion score, or the voice, it goes up, pretty much doubles it. Um, it's just night and day. And then, of course, when you're transferring from, you know, whether it's Box or Dropbox or some cloud or, you know, your other office halfway across the country, huge difference. I mean, you know, once you introduce packet loss uh, into something, um, things just totally bog down because now the TCP packets are having to retransmit and all kinds of bad things are happening. So in this transfer, it went up to 134 seconds. When you put VeloCloud behind it, it dropped it down to 13 seconds, even with 2% packet loss. And I can tell you with voice, we've gone up to 20% packet loss in our live trials and seen that voice is still clear, still viable. So it's literally night and day what it will do to correct negative network conditions. And this is why I'm telling you, ignore all the middle and the low end, you know, SD-WAN vendors are out there because it's a bunch of noise, right? And, you know, I hear different vendors say, oh, this is the one where if you want to keep your own firewall, you can't, you know, it doesn't really matter. Honestly, SD-WAN can go in front or behind a firewall. None of the solutions out there care. So why do they even say these silly things? I have no idea. But this is where the rubber meets the road. Can it correct negative network conditions? And can it do it when you only have one circuit? Because keep in mind, a lot of people that are going to SD-WAN are going because it's cheap, right? It, it really, you know, they couldn't afford the, you know, mega MPLS network with the big pipes on MPLS. They just couldn't. So now they're either, they're either going all MPLS or what I see a lot of, the most of what I see, is a little bit of MPLS because they can't afford a huge pipe of MPLS. So they'll go with a little bit, and then they'll get an Internet circuit. And that's the most popular combination that we see out there today. And so when you look at that as a prime example, uh, you got MPLS. And the only thing you're really worried about with MPLS is it's rarely bad. It's when it goes down. Then you got, you know, Comcast cable here. I wasn't going to pick on anybody, so this is fortuitous. But, um, you know, good Lord. I mean, broadband, it, it has a reputation, right? But even when broadband's having a bad day and MPLS is down, the user experience is what you see at the top, green super green. So they're absolutely digging it. They don't notice anything's wrong with voice. They don't know that the MPLS went down. Again, sub-second failover. Everything is clear sailing to these guys. And that's what you want. You know, in the background, what you also want is our SD-WAN service because then, then we're the one calling, you know, the provider over at Comcast or whoever for these internet links and saying, hey, you know, what's going on? Another example. Uh, this, is, this is basically without VeloCloud at 2% packet loss. So you see download speed is 4.14 megabits per second, upload is about 3. <clears throat> so it's kind of crappy. Ping time is 20 milliseconds, and the ping time is high because they're losing packets. Now, with VeloCloud, you see the ping time 
goes goes less than half, goes from 20 milliseconds to 8 milliseconds, and you've literally quadrupled your upload and download speeds. You went from 4 and 3, you went to 16 and 16 here, almost 17. So dramatic difference. Again, this is why I'm telling you, don't go with these mid and low-end solutions, you know, the big leaves, the, the, you know, cloud genetics, whatever. Ask them those questions. What do you do about negative network conditions? 90% of the time you're going to hear, oh, we don't do anything. We, you know, we're praying that you, you know, we hope you got a second circuit because we're going we're gonna to go flee over there. Forget about it. It's not the way the world works. You got to deal with your problems. Fellow cloud deals with the problems. And so you wind up with a scenario that looks like this. MPLS, almost always in the mix. Yeah, it's not necessarily, you know, you're looking for 100 megs bandwidth, maybe the MPLS is 20 megs, but you go get an 80 meg uh, internet circuit. I see that all the time. But this is great because you can mix and match everything in there. You can get up on day one using LTE, bond as many of those together to get the size pipe that you need. Voice will work, video will work, everything will work, and you're up day one. And then later when the circuits come in, they don't turn in the uh, LTE. They say, hey, this is a great, this works great on day one. If I ever got to rely on it, because let's say some guy literally circles my building with a backhoe, who cares? I got wireless failover with SC WAN. So they usually keep it. It's more money in your pocket. They're going to use it for failover. Um, absolutely terrific. And again, you're not, you're not worried about, gee, does it work when it fails over? Because SC WAN is typically doing active, active, uh, sub-second failover. A um, little bit of active passive on the LTE because you don't want to run up the bill on the LTE. We've got some great plans that cap at $163 a month, by the way. Uh, so that's great peace of mind. But uh, basically, active, active failover, and it just works. And you can choose your circuits and choose your providers and do all that through Airspring. And that's why we're telling you to use Airspring, because you get the choice of 20-plus carriers. You can use any type of product from any of those carriers. You can mix multiple SD-WAN vendors into the same topology and the same customer to get the result and change all this stuff around over time with no penalties. So there's a quick video. <clears throat> I hope you guys are going to be able to see this correctly. If not, um, I'll have to send out the link later. But it basically just shows how easy it is, you know, and this is what it looks like when we ship a unit um, to your customer. So essentially, they get the box in the mail. And this is how easy it is. I mean, as you know, with a lot of our services like IP phone and so forth, we'll actually do a truck roll out there and we'll put in the phones, we'll put in the switch, <clears throat> we'll put in the router, we'll put in the circuit, you know, connects over our cloud. But with this is just very, very simple. You just unpack it, give it some power, start to plug the circuits in. Again, what I always see is internet, a little bit of MPLS, plug that in there. And once that lights up, it's very easy. These actually have, uh, this is an example of a uh, pull activation. A lot of times we do push where uh, it means as soon as this thing gets connectivity, it goes and registers itself and provisions. But in this case, <clears throat> you can actually connect to the onboard Wi-Fi, which can be shut off later too, by the way. Um, but you can connect to the onboard Wi-Fi for the box and then just using a web browser, go into an email that was sent to you from us during the provisioning process, click on a link, <clears throat> it'll go back to the web page that's on the VeloCloud uh, Edge unit, it'll go ahead and log into the orchestrator in the gateway. It'll license it and activate it, and off you go. It's literally that easy to deploy and to use. And then the light will go green on the front of it, and then everybody's up. Now, what's really cool about this, too, is you saw her plug in the Internet and the MPLS, and that's what I've been trying to tell you is any service that we provision to you over the Internet, any service that we provision to you over MPLS, those can fail over and back between those two. So if you're getting voice over MPLS today, you could get it over the internet circuit. If you're getting internet and static public IP addresses from Airspring over your internet connection and it fails, you could keep those same IPs and get all those same services delivered over the MPLS connection or any other circuit that we're, we're providing or, or basically overlaying with SD-WAN. And that is just amazing. And that's kind of been the, the story of Airspring is giving you choice because SD-WAN is no different, and I'm going to use this analogy. Back in the day when MPLS came out, you could get it, of course, from every different carrier. You could get it from Airspring, you could get it from anybody else. But what we did is we basically, oh, let me go back a slide. What we did is we said, look, now you can get MPLS from all these different carriers and glue them together. So Airspring Unified Connectivity, or as I call it, AUC, gives you freedom. Any carrier, any circuit, any technology, anywhere. 
So you can have a network that's a mix of SD-WAN, MPLS, point-to-point -point links, broadband, fiber, LTE, point-to-point -point VPN, and have hosted phones, VoIP and SIP trunks, faxing, and get that from all these different carriers, and AirSpring becomes the glue. So that's why I always tell you, back in the day, you didn't necessarily go buy MPLS from one carrier. When you had a geographic footprint, and of course, you know, we got famous for multi-site deployments for this reason, and you needed multiple carriers in there. Did you want to put the onus on you or put it on your customer to make all the phone calls to manage all that, not only project manage it during the rollout, but then later when circuits and things go down and go wrong, do you want all the finger pointing? So that's why I'm also saying don't go sell your, your customer a enterprise-grade SD-WAN solution. Sign up with AirSpring because you want that choice. You want the choice of multiple SD-WAN vendors. You want to be able to deploy it on up to 20 carriers with all the different types of circuits that they've got. And, of course, we're you know marking and remarking QoS between all these carriers as well and escalating the support tickets to resolution, pouring tons of resources like CCIEs and, and SIP certified engineers into those uh, cases to get resolution as needed. So it saves you a lot of headache. And from the prices shown, you know, we're still a price leader, so why not, right? Again, all the choices. Here you see, you know, quite a few of the carriers that we have. It's now 20 plus. Uh, but none of the penalties, meaning that you don't have to manage it yourself. Including even the people who are saying, ah, but I usually deploy these because I want full access. Well, now we've taken away the last excuse. Uh, you know, in the past, of course, carriers didn't give full access to anything. <clears throat> We're doing that with the SD-WAN. Of course, you got to sign a waiver, but there's no scenario now that you can't sell uh, us in with this kind of, you know, carrier mix and circuit mix and technology mix and the kind of access and the low pricing that we're giving. So very, very cool. Now that said, MPLS is still far, far, far from dead. Um, what's really interesting about MPLS is it's less noise on the carrier side and more noise in the customer environment, meaning that the customers are actually extending MPLS into their environments, particularly if you've got a customer who is a managed service provider <clears throat> or you know, they basically want to connect to their customers or extranet third parties or so on, we can actually pop a, let's say, 24 or a 48 port switch in their environment. And no matter how their customer gets connected to whatever carrier that then gets hauled back to AirSpring at one of our national data centers, um, so they could, you could have 100 customers and they're across 20 different carriers and they're all connected differently. Some we had to drop a T1 in for, some we had to connect, uh, you know, uh, over MPLS or Internet or SD-WAN or IPsec VPN tunnel, it doesn't matter. It all becomes one unified network. And then when we drop this off to the customer's environment, we can drop each one of those, um, you know, customers onto a different port, <clears throat> onto a different port. So if a lot of, I won't go too deep on the slide, but if a lot of you are familiar with VLANs on a switch, that's a layer two separation. VRS and MPLS are just a layer three separation. It's very easy to configure. And uh, we do a couple of training labs with customers who, who need this kind of separation because they want to use one network. They're very much like a, a carrier, right, where you've got one network, but then you have thousands of customers that are all secure and isolated um, on it. Customers want the same thing, and we can design that for them. And the exciting part of it is not only can uh, a customer keep the customer's customers all separated, but then, you know, coming back to their headquarters, but then you basically create VRS, or just think of these as virtual bubbles. The VRS is like a virtual route bubble. You can go put different services. Like here at Airspring, whether you knew it or not, um, all the different services we provide get put into these bubbles. And so when you build the customer, we simply add those services to their, their profile definition, and that's how they get access to the SIP trunks or the IP-hosted phones or the Internet or this or that. And so a lot of the customers, they're not going to be carriers, but customers have customers, and they're providing services to them. They want to build their networks very much the same way, and so they can do that. And, of course, at the end of the day, every carrier's core, whether it's AT&T or it's us or it's somebody else, is an MPLX, uh, MPLS mix. In fact, um, if you don't connect to the cloud, for example, via uh, you know, SD-WAN, either spinning up a virtual appliance or going through the course, then you can get AT&T NetBond, but you don't have to get their MPLS. You can just you know, do SD-WAN with us, and, and of course, where the glue will glue you over to that MPLS instance that goes back up to AWS or Azure or whoever. And um, they've got, I think, like tons, just dozens and dozens of SaaS providers. Um, if you've got MPLS customers today who are looking to take it to the next level, keep in mind I've got a lot of customers who use SD-WAN on top of MPLS, even when it's pure MPLS and they're not mixing the Internet and these other circuits together. The reason they do it is they want encryption. MPLS had no encryption. 
if you had two MPLS circuits to one site, it couldn't fail over any sooner than 30 seconds. And you weren't using both pipes simultaneously. You can do that now with SD-WAN. It'll take both MPLS cir circuits, bond them together, sub-second failover, but you get the total bandwidth. So if you had 200 meg MPLS circuits, you get a 200 meg. Um, no reliance on BGP. You get QoS, um, application engine identity. There's just a lot of monitoring. There's a lot of neat features with it. And so that's why we say SD-WAN and MPLS, it's a marriage and a divorce, they're better together. You get the high, high quality of MPLS being the ultimate underlay circuit. It's better than internet, it's better than broadband, it's better than anything else that's out there. But you don't have to buy it in the large quantities that you had it before. Um, and then of course you get encryption, sub-second failover and everything else. Um, diving into the actual use case scenarios that are going to drive your revenue. So we just talked about why people add SD-WAN to MPLS. We talked a bit about why they use it with LTE. You know, in the past people would say, yeah, LTE, that'd be great, but I can't get a big enough pipe. Well, now you can because with us, you can bond up to 16 of those things together and get a huge pipe that's somewhere, you know, up to 640 megabits, um, sometimes even more in that when you overlay it with SD-WAN. And you can run voice, you can run video, you can fail over, you can do interim connectivity, you can do remote sites, you can do temporary events, indoor, outdoor, it's amazing. Um, cloud connectivity is typically uh, accomplished, like I said, either through a gateway, through NetBond, or through a virtual appliance. Um, enhancing broadband, I mean, Comcast is a heck of a lot more viable with an SD-WAN offering than they ever were. Uh, so were most broadband providers because it wasn't business class. Now you put SD-WAN on broadband, you got a business class environment. It's fast, it's inexpensive. Um, enhancing internet even. Um, this is quite interesting. I, you know, there's a lot of customers, particularly in the financial sector, <clears throat> who have IPsec VPN connections to different providers in their industry. Uh, when they have to change their site, they move to a different building or they change carriers or whatever, those public IPs change, it really throws a wrench in, in that connectivity for them. We're able to take a block of AirSpring IP addresses and deliver that across SD-WAN to anywhere they want those IPs. They could be in California. We give them, you know, six public Internet IPs. They put those on their firewalls. They do these third-party VPN connections to whoever. Then they decide that they're moving the California office to Texas fine, those IPs can be rerouted over to, they just really pick up the SD-WAN box, move to Texas, the IPs are there again. That's not the way it used to work, as you all know. Um, you had an internet circuit, the internet provider gave you some, you know, some IP addresses. If that circuit went down or, or you switched providers, those IPs went away because they belong to the carrier. That's not the case anymore. And you don't need BGP and you don't need all this fancy stuff. We can, you know, give you, we've got over 26,000 IPs here at Airspring. We can deliver those wherever you need them. So virtual IP delivery is really, really hot right now. The other thing that's hot is leveraging cloud-based firewalls. Zscaler is awesome. If you're getting your internet and you're kind of pushing that over the SD-WAN a little more upstream, you get inbound congestion control, which helps you with, you know, denial of service attacks and a lot of other things. It also improves uh, over-the-top voice, whether you're using our phones or somebody else's. Um, SD-WAN for failover, again, active, active. I see a lot of people using MPLS and internet. That was even in uh, VeloCloud's video. Failing over to LTE afterwards, uh, also using it for interim connectivity. And then regulatory compliance. Think about... Think about all the digital displays that are in a retail chain store or in a bank branch, um, the ATMs, or think about the point of sale systems at Home Depot or Target. Um, those are not part, or <laughs> a lot of times they are, unfortunately. They should not be part, and this is part of the new PCI requirements for credit card systems and other stuff. They should not be part of the general land. They need those segmented, just like they need, you know, uh, Wi-Fi segmented. They don't want that in the corporate network. Um, so VeloCloud authors traffic separation and also that extending MPLS into the branch offices does that as well. So we've got a lot of segmentation techniques. That's really hot for your compliance customers. If you mention that to them, they're going to get interested, uh, interested in SD-WAN very quickly, um, particularly since it has encryption as well. But the traffic separation is huge. And then enhancing failover, we talked about that. Retail, retail chains, so we've got some slides later on that, but this is really popular because typically in a retail chain, you get one cheap broadband circuit, not two. Um, you may even get LTE, but the reality of it is you've got one connection, you need to enhance it, and you need a phone there, usually one or two at a minimum. Now with SD-WAN, you can do that. In the past, it was really, really hard. You get a broadband circuit in there, you can't hear the phone. Um, you get something else that's too expensive. It, it's just really a problem. And then these are the kind of deployments that we're seeing across the board. They come in all sizes and flavors. 
But what's driving it is, look, when you're doing M&A, and there's a lot of M&A, particularly in telecom, but in all industries there's M&A, rolling out and, and these boxes, SD-WAN boxes, to you know, your new company that's joining your company or whatever, getting this all tied together is a lot faster with SD-WAN. Um, PCI segmentation and getting that network and security visibility is huge. <clears throat> Being able to lower costs by blending Internet with MPLS, not necessarily getting rid of MPLS, I don't see a lot of people doing that, frankly, but I see them lowering the cost, so they're blending it. In some cases where they had very little voice going on, just a few phones, and they were mostly data, yeah, sometimes they do get rid of it. Um, other areas where they're looking to, you know, increase or connect to the cloud, all these different scenarios come into play. You know, they're trying to avoid truck rolls. They're trying to do centralized management. Um, they had people flying all over the country servicing their sites. SC-WAN solves these problems. Um, you know, just another example, 1,000 locations, 20,000 employees, they needed to segment their PCI traffic, they wanted to manage it from a central location, you know, they're flying people all over the place, <clears throat> they didn't really have the ability to not only prioritize their voice and video traffic, but deprioritize their bulk traffic. What about their, you know, server backups and the stuff that they really need, you know, that used to be run at night, and to be honest with you, it's run 24 hours a day now. So they need it to continue to run. In many cases, some jobs, they can't halt them in the middle of the day, but they don't want them, you know, affecting the voice and the video and the and the business critical apps. And so that's another thing that doesn't get talked about enough in SD-WAN. It's all about, oh, prioritize, prioritize, prior okay, what about deprioritize? What about, you know, there's, there's basically priority at the top, voice and video and key apps. Then there's the middle stuff, which is, eh, you know, I, I want to go surf the internet or whatever. And then there's the stuff at the bottom, which is I need to do this, you know, 200 gig backup of my server every day, right? And, and all of that can run simultaneously. And that is something that SD-WAN does a terrific job uh, of. And then, of course, getting connected to the cloud. There's almost no company today that's not using cloud. The question is, how are they getting connected? Today, 90% of them are using an IPsec VPN tunnel over the Internet. It's simply not adequate. So you can dramatically enhance, uh, particularly they're starting to use virtual desktops, they're doing video conferencing, they're doing a lot of stuff that's cloud-based. It's not good enough to have an IPsec tunnel. So we're seeing a huge surge in AT&T NetBond, huge surge in SD-WAN uptake for services to the cloud. And then again, we're giving full access to the portal. So when your customer logs in, they're not getting some you know, watered down view. They're going to get the whole thing. They're going to see everything in there, which is nice. If they sign the waiver, they get read write. Defining the business policies, there's an application identification engine in here that identifies over 2,500 applications automatically. So it's very easy to create policies and prioritize or deprioritize uh, different apps that are running and then to verify that, in fact, those policies are getting used and they're actually getting prioritized and how that looks from a traffic standpoint. So why would you use AirSpring for SD-WAN? It's very simple. It continues our history of multi-site deployments. You know, we did that with Full Mesh with all the different carriers with uh, MPLS. We're doing that for SD-WAN. Same story, different technology. But at the end of the day, you can take a lot of these complex solutions and have a very, very simple delivery, and that's what you want. You want to make money, you want a happy customer. AirSpring Unified Connectivity AUC does that for you. It gives you many carriers, many technologies, many different vendors. You might be using, you know, a mix of SD-WAN vendors, VeloCloud and Mushroom in the same implementation. You want to deal with one channel team who can tweak that quote, uh, deliver the network to you where all these technologies, even if it's not SD-WAN, you might have something where it's some point-to-point -point circuits, you got something that's pure MPLS, and then you've got this SD-WAN, you need it all bonded together. We do that on one network, one support, and one bill. And then, of course, all the expertise. It takes a tremendous amount of expertise when customers start asking heavy questions around compliance and cloud and data center integration and networking. A lot of the carriers freak out because they don't have engineers who've worked in bars and worked in cloud and worked in so many places like my, myself and my team have. We speak their language. We know exactly what they're talking about. We've got deep playbooks on integration with AWS and Azure and all these different places. That's what's going to make you look good and ultimately get that sale sooner because they have confidence that we can pull it off and we can. And, and honestly, when you're looking at some of these solutions, it takes those kind of experts because some SD-WAN, you know, things will happen. There's a bug in the software. There's a bug in the phone with the phone vendor, you know, Cisco or Polycom or different vendors. And who's going to troubleshoot all these things end-to-end -end with no finger pointing? AirSpring is. And, of course, we deliver that across the board very consistently with all the different products that you see here. We have hosted phones. <clears throat> we use MetaSwitch. As you know, Broad, Broadsoft just got acquired by Cisco. So I'm... I'm you know, kind of expecting the prices to shoot through the roof, who knows. 
Uh, we have a contact center. We do SIP trunking. We do 4 billion SIP calls a month. I mean, nobody beats us on SIP. Long distance voice, of course, still doing TDM, PRI, analog circuits, uh, business class internet, broadband as well, managed connectivity, MPLS, SD-WAN, 4G wireless. 5G is coming soon. It's very exciting. It's going to go up to 1 gig speeds. We'll be talking about that to you in some of the agent trainings in 2018. Um, still doing managed failover, managed security. We do have managed sonic wall firewalls, so um, you know, keep that in mind. Customer doesn't have to manage their own firewall. We'll also be offering firewalls on the SD-WAN boxes. That will be coming probably fourth quarter or first quarter next year with Palo Alto, Fortinet, Checkpoint, and others with Bello Cloud. We'll announce more with that. And then uh, a lot of customers, too, are using cloud-based uh, service firewalls like Zscaler and so on. So <clears throat> a lot of options around firewalls. We're still doing Cisco and Atran manage routers, manage switches. We're one of the few phone companies for IP phones that literally can guarantee the solution end-to-end. -end. If you look at it today, a lot of phones are ship and prey. We do a truck roll with an engineer, puts the phone on the desk, wires it to the switch, wires that to the router, wires that to the circuit, up to uh, AirSpring, <clears throat> and, and we guarantee it end-to-end. -end. So there you have it. And then, of course, a lot of services are still free. Not only did we put a lot of free stuff into the SD-WAN, but AirNMS, which is our network monitoring system, is still free as well as well as air care and a lot of other cool tools that we throw in there. And then, of course, this escalation, which shows, you know, one throat to choke goes all the way up to our CEO, Avi Lonstein.